might long to see the face of Christ. Song of Solomon tells us that his voice is sweet, his face is lovely, that we might search for Christ in all things. So this morning, instead of giving you a long lecture on the Reformation, I will spare you and only share a bit of my testimony. For as we seek the face of Christ together, may we find him in all our testimonies and stories this morning. It was a while back while I was doing religious education in college when I was under the burden of a spiritual stronghold. Now some of you may not be familiar with that language. Perhaps you've heard it used around a little too loosely, but a spiritual stronghold is that which keeps us captive to something other than Christ. Something that places on us a heavy burden or condemnation that weighs us down from living out the full liberty in Christ Jesus. And for me, though I was in a theology track as a religion major, I was under a heavy spiritual stronghold of none other than anxiety and self-questioning and insecurity and uncertainty. I felt that even though I was studying religion, that I couldn't please God, that I had to work to earn God's love, that even though I felt the call to ministry, I was falling short and failing, and there was nothing that I could do to earn God's favor. I was stressed out. I was wondering if I was pleasing God whatsoever. It even came out in my relationships and in my education. Now, I'm pretty lucky because Christine is not here this morning. She and Hayden are on a Boy Scout camping trip. And you might think, well, they, they get rained out? Well, I want to boast about my wife a little bit. She and two other tents, their campers, were the only ones who survived through the night this morning. She said, well, the other tents had two inches of water and were getting rained down. People were going home. Even the den leader left to go home. Christina and Hayden had a nice dry tent because they prepared and they took all the things. Anyway, I, I tell that because she's a pretty awesome lady. So, uh, but I mention that to say that if she were here right now, she would tell you about how insecure and how many questions I had, just how much that stronghold put a death grip on me, and in some respects her, because at that time she was my, my girlfriend. We were contemplating marriage, and here I was wafting in my decisions and in my commitments, and it came out of her, don't ask her about it, by the way, you don't need to ask her about it, you know, if you see her later, you don't need to say anything, okay, it's embarrassing for me. But suffice it to say, I was reading books in that religion major and really coming to terms with the stronghold. Couldn't shake it. So one day I picked up a book by a, a famous author by the name of R.C. Sproul, who started to talk about the values that came out of the Reformation. And in his book, he highlighted none other than Martin Luther, of course, the, the one, the catalyst who served uh, as the person who lit the Reformation on fire, and I read about how Martin Luther's own insecurities and uncertainties and anxiety drove him crazy as well. He entered the monastery and he was so inflicted by this heavy condemnation that he could not please the Lord, that eventually he came to read the Bible, and specifically Romans, where it admonished him and gave him the encouragement that grace was a gift freely given by God. It could not be earned. It could not work towards it. He could not go through all of the religious orders and all of the studies and all of the rituals that had been put in place by his orders as a monk in order to earn God's favor. And through that time, under that heavy burden, to some extent, we, we think he was a, a, a clinical, uh, clinically depressed as well, he came to discover that only by faith in Christ may one be saved through the gift of grace that God offers. And here I was, I don't remember the title of the book, but I remember very clearly the experience. I was in the bed, it was one of those bunk beds you get in the dorm room, and there I was reading this author, and in that book I found a mirror in the person of Martin Luther who I came to know as an ally of someone who was going through the very same thing I was going through, who busted through his own spiritual stronghold in order to experience liberation and freedom in Christ and, by the way, igniting the Reformation. And there in that book, I read about all of the values that shaped the Reformation. 
The value is established by what we see here in our order of worship as the five solas, or those five things that define who we are as Protestants, but more so as Christ followers. And as I learned about those five values, found an ally in the faith of Martin Luther, I too came out from under that heavy yoke and burden of condemnation in order to face freedom and liberation in Christ. It was first scripture alone that I came to realize that in my own spiritual walk, I had to shut all of the books that I was reading. Yeah, I had to read them for studies and I had to read them for school, but eventually at the end of the day, I had to turn off all of the different voices that I was getting in my head through these books and put them away. Many of you know I'm an avid reader and simply study God's word alone. Scripture alone. It was at the Council of Worms where the bishops drug Martin Luther before a court in order to claim that he was a heretic and there he said, look, everything that I have written, everything that I have preached comes from the very word of God alone. And he made a very famous statement as he said that it was on the word of God upon which he stands. He said, here I stand, I can do no other. And in that value, I found that we have to return to the Bible. That the many voices we have, the cacophony of noises with which we are faced every day, have to be silenced as we place ourselves before God's word and under Christ's authority as we stand before Scripture alone. So as I started to experience that through this, through this reading, through understanding these values, then we move to the next sola, which is grace alone. This changed my life. This is the radical doctrine, the radical theology that freed up Martin Luther, freed me up, and I would say probably freed most of you up. When you experience that, it is by grace alone that we are saved and that God offers salvation. Grace, according to Romans 3, which Haley read, and according to the Ephesians passage, which uh, Alice read, affirm for us that grace is a gift of God which means it's not something that we give to one another in order to be saved, but a free gift. It is something that God gives us freely. It doesn't have to be earned. It is not an entitlement from, based on from what we do. It is not something that we get after a hard day's work, like a bonus. Grace is a gift freely given to us. I was thinking about grace and thinking about our next value, which is faith alone and how these two things work together. What, what is it about our religion, our Christian faith, in which we're given a gift of grace, but then we have to come with faith alone? How does that work together? Well, I think about it, I'm thinking about Christmas. Lance mentioned that Christmas is right around the corner. Guys, you need to make your Christmas list. Jill and Carl will get you whatever you want this Christmas. You just need to make the list. I'm just kidding. So I got their attention now. I got Jill's attention, too. I'll go back. So make your Christmas list. Dylan, make your Christmas list. It's coming up. Awesome. So imagine this, guys. You go down to your tree, right, on Christmas morning, and you know the songs about Santa Claus. If you're naughty, Santa will write your name down. But I would imagine none of you got a, a coal in your stocking. Don't, don't admit if you did. I don't want to embarrass you. But there have been many times where we run down to the tree and open the gifts. But what happens if we were to run down to the Christmas tree and your parents are excited to give you everything you wanted for Christmas and you say to them, but I, I can't open these gifts. I don't deserve it. I, don't, I didn't earn it. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be your son or your daughter. I'm just going to leave the gifts under the tree and I'm going to walk out. How would your parents feel? How would you feel if your child did that to you? And I imagine that many of us come to the place of knowing God and there is that free gift of grace, but we tell God it's not good enough. I've got to work for it. I've got to earn this thing. I've got to pick myself up out of my bootstraps to redeem and save myself. I'm not worthy to be called your son or your daughter, but that's not how grace works. So when we think about grace alone and then we move to our next value, the faith alone, we also think that faith is not a work. Faith is not something that we have to put work into. Rather, faith is a response 
to, to begin to open the gift of grace that God has given us. God gives us the gift of grace, but our faith compels us, and it is our response in which we start to open and unwrap that gift in order to live into God's salvation and to receive God's salvation as Jesus is our personal Lord and Savior. I think what happened in my life, and this happens often throughout my life as I catch myself working back into this stronghold of trying to work and earn God's favor, is that we have the gift of grace and we have faith, but we start to put a scaffolding around faith as if faith alone needs help. We start to add works and right beliefs and right behaviors, and we try to pile on our faith all of these extra man-made things because we still feel like it's too easy to have faith alone. But when we look at the reformers and the values in which they instill, we see that that scaffolding falls away. Because if we try to work out our salvation, then we're proud. Then we can get in God's way and say, see, look what I did. I picked myself up with my bootstraps and I earned my salvation, but that's not how our faith works. And so we move to the fourth value of the Reformation, which is that we do things for God's glory alone. It is Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the first one, chapter 10, verse 31, in which Paul says that everything we do is for the glory of God. You see, when you start to add things to faith, and when you start to add things to grace, you start to add things to Scripture, then we are the ones who are able to boast. But when we discover that it is by God's grace, by Scripture alone, and by faith alone, and by, for God's glory alone, all of those things are taken away because we turn our attention to the fact that we do everything to give God all the glory. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about all of the fancy things that we do, but rather we do everything to draw attention to, to God and to give all things for His glory, that God might be lifted up, that His name might be praised, that we may embody in our life that, he is, that Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and giving God all the glory means that we are living into the fact that we are no longer our own, that we were purchased with the price of Christ's blood, and that through that purchase, God has redeemed us unto Himself, freed us from slavery, yes, liberated us, but ultimately allowed us to be wrapped up in God alone for His glory. That our identity may stem from none other than our fifth value, and that is Christ alone. Jesus' death on the cross, His life and teachings and ministry and what they taught us about how to live, His resurrection and victory over death itself is sufficient. You can take that to the bank. It is a promise upon which you can stand. And when we talk about serving Christ alone, we are recognizing that as we walk in this gift of grace, responding to God every day, committing to do all for the glory of God, for Christ alone, what we're saying is that we're trying to conform in the image of Christ. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 21. That not only may we seek His face, but that we may live for Christ and Christ alone, being conformed to His image, being reformed over and over again, which requires, I think, two things. First, it requires us to learn how to let go. You see, every day we want to wake up and we want to add that scaffolding to our life. We want to add on burdens to our life. We want to add extra things. And what I found about my walk with Christ is that every day that I commit to Jesus is a series of letting go of something. It's letting go of sin or addiction. It's letting go of my own insecurities or uncertainties. It's letting go of fear and the various trials that we have, the hindrances and the roadblocks that stand in Christ's way. So I think as we're conforming to the image of Christ and being reformed in order to be made new in the person of Christ, it requires us to practice letting go every day. You see, you come to church and you hear a sermon, it may be good, it may not be good, but the sermon isn't the point. The sermon is supposed to point you to something in your life you may need to let go of. 
It may be a challenge to let go of your sense of control. It may be a challenge to let go of those things that so easily ensnare you. It's a series of letting go. But the other thing I think of when I think about being conformed to the image of Christ, to serve Christ alone, comes from a Latin adage that comes from a mid-20th century theologian by the name of Karl Barth. And that Latin phrase is Ecclesia Semper Reformanda, the church ever reforming. And what Karl Barth argued was that the Reformation was, a one, was a, an event that took place over several years, but Reformation is something that is to happen continually in our life and in the life of the church. You see, we celebrate 500 years of Reformation on Tuesday, October 31st, when in 1517 Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the, to the wall of the church. But according to Karl Barth, and being conformed to the image of Christ, Reformation is something that happens to us every day. Not only by empowering us to let go of the things that get in the way of God, but by also coming to a place where we need to let go of the bigger things that might hinder us. Old prejudices the type of things that we do in order to try to work for salvation, trying to impress our friends, trying to come to a place where we can boast about those things that made us who we are. Reformation is a continual act of coming to terms with the fact that we are Christians, which literally means little Christ or Christ followers. Now, this is something uh, Karl Barth didn't practice in his life. He was a flawed individual. And it's something that necessarily didn't happen in Martin Luther's life. In fact, both Karl Barth and Martin Luther, I would argue, two of, the, one of, two of uh, some of the greatest theologians in the evangelical church were both flawed individuals and forgot the fact that Reformation is required. Karl Barth had some scruples. He was quite flawed. But Martin Luther, at, almost at the end of his life, forgot that Reformation is something that continually happens, and, and he picked up on some bad habits. A good friend of mine, by the name of Steve Ecker, who is the church history professor at Southeastern Southern Baptist Seminary, he graduated from Palm Beach Atlantic University with Christina and me, led a group of students this past year on a pilgrimage through Martin Luther's old stomping ground. And it's interesting because we have a resident pilgrim here with us who's going to teach us, Michael, about all the things he did in Europe this past summer while my friend was there at the same time. They may have run into each other, I knew. And as a church historian and professor, he taught his students the different places of the Reformation. But they had to make a stop along the way in Germany. And their stop was one of the biggest uh, gas chambers or concentration camps in Germany, Buchenwald. Steve Ecker wrote a, an article for the Southeastern Baptist Journal and explained that Buchenwald as a concentration camp was an important part of the Reformation because sadly it was Martin Luther's anti-Semitic writings at the end of Martin Luther's life that the Nazis used as propaganda in order to build the Nazi Germany church and influence people to put the Jews in a place of Holocaust. So Steve argued that going to Buchenwald gives us the whole picture of a man not only flawed in his anti-Semitic writings, but a church that is flawed when it fails to be ever reforming in its practices and in its prejudices. It was important for those uh, Baptist students to learn that when the church fails to conform to Christ, it starts conforming to culture and other aspects of society. It loses its vision. In celebrating and observing the Reformation, my hope for you is that you will pray and reflect on these five solas. Scripture alone, grace alone, faith alone, glory to God alone and Christ alone, that you too may live in freedom to serve Christ but in living freedom that you will come under reformation and sanctification and holiness that you might be conformed to Christ and Christ alone. That was a spiritual stronghold that I lived through that shaped my faith and my testimony, but it was through the gift of grace that I now stand here before you.
I can do no other. Amen.